Welcome to the fifth lecture for abnormal psychology. This week we'll be talking about anxiety disorders. Similar to the last lecture, as we talked about the mood disorders, as we talk about anxiety disorders, uh, we're going to be focusing on helping you gain a better understanding of the what, why, and how of these disorders. So again, what do they look like? Their diagnosis and presentation. Why do individuals develop these disorders? I'm talking about the case conceptualization here of these disorders. And then finally, how do we treat them? Now, there are several different anxiety disorders. Uh, we're going to try to get to all of them. Uh, all of them are very, I guess, commonly seen in the population. And so hopefully by the end of the lecture, you'll have a good understanding of each of them. And then similar to the depressive disorders and bipolar disorders, it's important to recognize that an individual can have an anxiety disorder due to substance or medication that they're using or due to another medical condition. In those situations, the diagnosis should always be specified uh, as the cause or source. And like I mentioned, anxiety disorders are actually very common. Uh, in the last lecture, I talked about the frequency at which people experience depression, and I mentioned that it was the most common of the psychological disorders. And that's true, but if we look at anxiety disorders as a group, they actually occur more often than the depressive disorders do. Uh, it's estimated that about 12% of the population uh, sometime in their life will experience either social phobia or a specific phobia at a level where it's impairing, um, where it's causing some type of functional problems. And then about 5 to 6% at some point in their life will experience generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, or separation anxiety disorder. Again, these are at levels where it's impairing, it's causing problems. A much smaller percent, only about a little higher than 1% of the population will experience agoraphobia. We'll talk about that this, in this lecture as well, though. And if you put these together, uh, you'll notice that the lifetime prevalence is almost 30% uh, of the population sometime in their life will experience one of these disorders at a level that, it, that is impairing. If you add up all the numbers of the individual disorders, you'll notice that that doesn't add up to 28.8%, and that's again due to comorbidity. Like we talked about with depression, some of these disorders overlap with each other. Uh, they're different disorders, but if an individual experiences uh, social phobia, they may also have panic attacks and may experience agoraphobia. So an individual can have more than one of these at a time. Now, to give you a few other numbers concerning the anxiety disorders, these are more commonly present in females than males. About 30% uh, uh, within females and only about 20% of males will experience an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. It's, anxiety disorders are also more common in non-Hispanic Caucasian Americans compared to other ethnic groups. And then with anxiety disorders, the average age of onset is, is relatively young, 11 years old. Now some of the disorders as we talk about them, you'll see are more focused on childhood. Um, and the remaining ones you more often see in adulthood where they start to cause problems, but the first symptoms of them really start in that adolescent age range. All right, so let's jump into then the what of anxiety disorders. We'll begin with separation anxiety disorder. And this is perhaps the best place to begin because this is the one that typically shows up in childhood. When we're talking about separation anxiety disorder, what we're really talking about here is a fear, a worry, anxiety about losing an attachment figure. Now, most often that's the parents uh, that the child will be afraid of losing, but it could be grandparents or it could be an older sibling if that individual is the one who cares for the child. 
the child's main attachment figure. The child has to have at least three of the symptoms listed here. Uh, a excessive worry about losing the attachment figure, excessive worry about some type of event that might cause the separation, uh, like maybe being kidnapped or maybe there being an earthquake or something that would uh, cause that separation. And then where we actually see the worry come out in behavior is a refusal to uh, leave that caregiver. Refusal to allow that caregiver to go out of the home or refuse refusal of uh, being separated in any way from that caregiver. So these are often the children who will scream or yell or throw a huge tantrum uh, at any time when they're going to be left at school or left, you know, with the babysitter, so any time that they would be uh, without that caregiver. Now, like I said, it's most common with children. Uh, with children, these types of behaviors have to be present for at least four weeks. The child uh, also has to be a little older. It can't be seen in children ages three to four. That's considered kind of normal behavior to not want to separate uh, uh, from your parents at that time. But more recently, uh, it's been recognized by the field that this can be seen in adults as well. However, with adults, this, the symptoms of the separation anxiety disorder have to be present for a full six months, so much longer. In thinking about this showing up with adults too, uh, it is less common or less frequently there. And typically when we see it with adults, it's no longer with the separation from the parents. Adults oftentimes have spent years separated from their parents and so uh, not necessarily an issue anymore. But we see it more so with separation from their significant other. For example, uh, worked with a client at one time who uh, significant other uh, had some unexpected health concerns, kind of out of the blue came up. And this client feared that she would lose her husband, that he was going to die. And that was a real fear at the time. Now, fortunately, he recovered, you know, his uh, health concerns went away and he got better through treatment. And so the danger, the worry, uh, the actual worry wasn't there. But she couldn't let go of that worry. She had persistent nightmares uh, that uh, he was going to die, that she would be left alone, that uh, she would no longer be able to see him again. She had physical symptoms uh, whenever, you know, leading up to a time where he had to go somewhere without her, and then all throughout his uh, kind of being away. And just the constant kind of on her mind that uh, he might die at some point. And she couldn't let go of that. And so for her, you know, the separation anxiety disorder was, was definitely there because of the worries that she had. The next anxiety disorder that I want to talk about is specific phobia. This is when an individual has a marked fear about any specific object or situation. We often hear about these ones. This might be a fear of uh, spiders, a fear of bees, a fear of elevators, fear of heights, uh, many different kind of options here. And, and it could be endless. Uh, the list could be endless. Uh, what might lead to a specific phobia. Now, it can't just be a regular fear. M many of you listening probably have some type of fear of spiders or snakes or bees or something like that. The key that makes it a specific phobia is when um, there's an immediate fear if the object or situation is, is around, that that object or situation is actively avoided, that the fear is out of proportion of the danger, 
But then here's the big one. It has to cause significant distress and impairment. So even if you're afraid of bees, if it's not somehow uh, stopping you from going to school or stopping you from going to work or uh, breaking up your family relationships, uh, then it's not a real specific phobia. It has to be impairing in your life. So with this disorder, the, the fear and the apparent impairment that goes along with it has to be present for at least six months. One of the interesting things about this fear is uh, most of the time uh, when somebody experiences the feared object, and this is true whether it's the disorder or any of us when we experience something that uh, scares us, uh, it usually speeds our body up. Our heart starts pounding faster, our breath gets shorter, uh, we're, we get ready for the fight or flight. Uh, However, there's one specific phobia, or one class of specific phobias, which are the blood injection fears. So this is fear of blood, if you see blood, or fear of needles, things like that. And that actually slows the body down. So your heart starts beating slower. And in essence, what happens with, with this, these types of fears, the uh, kind of uh, blood goes slower, things slow down so much that Oftentimes, that's when somebody passes out. They faint uh, because of this. Uh, now, I, I have on there a question, well, why? Uh, and it makes sense. You know, if, um, you know, you were uh, um, stabbed with a needle or, or something in a dangerous way, uh, your body would want to slow down. It wouldn't want to send that throughout your whole body. Uh, whatever germs are with it or things like that. Uh, if you, you know, were cut, your body would want to slow the blood down so it doesn't all flow out as quickly. And so just an interesting aspect that within the specific phobias, there's actually two different reactions uh, that we can have to those feared objects. The next one, uh, and uh, most common of the anxiety disorders is social anxiety disorder. This is when an individual has a marked fear about one or more social situations. Uh, and the fear is due to a belief about being criticized or judged negatively by others. It doesn't have to be verbal or they, uh, they don't worry that somebody's gonna stand up and call them out and start to belittle them in front of everyone else, uh, but just a worry that everybody is thinking negative thoughts about them. And because of this worry with social anxiety disorder, the individual will start to act in a way that um, they avoid that anxiety provoking situation. They avoid social situations as much as possible. If they do have to be present in a social situation, then um, there's extreme kind of anxiety with that and worry and rumination over it. Again, it has to last six months or more, and there has to be marked impairment with it. So it's not just your regular shyness, and it's not just individuals who prefer to be alone, uh, but it's individuals who um, really have trouble with social situations because they get anxious about them. With this, it's, it's usually uh, gets better with familiarity and so individuals with social anxiety won't have that same anxiety around family members and close relatives. Also, if they're, say, around co-workers for a long period of time, it's expected that over time they'll get less and less anxious about those co-workers. Uh, same thing with friends and uh, other people. Let me tell you about a couple clients that I've worked with with social anxiety disorder. Uh, one of them was a, a Hispanic male who, uh, when he was a child, he got teased and picked on a lot uh, by others at school. And they picked on him because of his ethnicity and culture. Uh, they picked on him because he looked different. And he internalized a lot of that. And so there was a lot of depression, I guess, feelings of low self-worth, um, criticalness about himself. 
But where the social anxiety disorder came in is he just always assumed that others were gonna think negatively of him. And so for this individual, whenever he would have a conversation with somebody, even if it was just a brief conversation, he would spend days playing over that conversation in his head and thinking about all the things that he said wrong and all the things that he should have said differently. Now, if it was possible, he would avoid to all extents any social situations. So there were a number of clubs that he wanted to join. He was in college at this point when I was working with him, uh, but he would avoid those. He wouldn't go. He had to go to school, but he would sign up for the classes where he thought the fewest people would be in attendance or the classes he thought he could slip in and slip out without anybody noticing him. Sometimes he'd sign up for a class and he'd get to the room and realize, oh no, there's no way really that I can slip in and out of this room. So he'd drop the class and uh, just not take that one. When he knew that he did have a social interaction that he had to do, so for example, he had to go talk to his instructor about an assignment, or he had to participate in a group project for a class, he would spend days preparing for it. He would plan out exactly what he would say in that conversation and plan out exactly how he would respond to all the different things that the instructor or his classmates might say to him. And he'd get it planned out perfectly in his head. However, no matter how much planning, when he got into the situation, his anxiety would start to take control. He'd turn bright red, feel like everybody noticed that, and end up just fumbling over his words, and then ruminate for days and days about how he messed that up. Interestingly for him, this fear also showed up in social media. And so this was a while back when Facebook was relatively new, uh, but when he first signed up for Facebook, he had intense fears that he didn't have enough friends on Facebook. And everybody would look at his profile and see the few number of friends that he had and think that he was uh, a loser because he didn't have enough friends. And he always thought, if I just had this number of friends, then it'd be okay. Then I wouldn't have anything to worry about. And he'd ruminate on this. Uh, and over time, he got more and more friends, but where the social anxiety played tricks on him is no matter how many friends he got, even if he passed his previous number that he had set, he would set a new number and say, well, at the time I was meeting with him, it was up to a thousand. He had to have a thousand friends or everybody was going to look at him as, as socially inept. So you can see how this anxiety just kind of in, in, in kind of was consistent with him. He couldn't let go of these worries about the social situations. A second client that I worked with, uh, she was had graduated from college and was in her uh, first job out of college and had been in it for about five years at the point that I started meeting with her. Now she, because of her social anxiety, purposely took a, an IT job where she did computers because in that job, she didn't have to interact much with others. She could just focus on doing her computer work. It worried her every once in a while when she would have to talk to her boss. That was stressful for her. She thought she was being judged, but fortunately she didn't have to talk to coworkers very often and she didn't, of course, ever have to talk with any consumers or things like that. However, she was good at her job. And so after about five years, uh, she got offered a promotion. And that's what led to her coming into treatment, was getting offered this promotion. Now, this is where the social anxiety came into play. Usually we'd think a promotion, that's great news. But for her, with this promotion, she was now gonna be a boss. She was going to have to monitor the work of others. She was going to have to talk to them and tell them ways that they can improve or uh, ways that they were doing good. She was going to have to lead meetings, uh, regular meetings with coworkers and, and other people. And she just couldn't do it. As much as she wanted the additional pay and as much as she knew that this was the right thing to do, her social anxiety was telling her she couldn't do it. 
So we worked with her to help her kind of uh, face those fears. And we'll talk about methods of treatment a little bit later. The next one is panic disorder. Panic disorder always starts with a, a panic attack. A panic attack is this sudden onset of intense physical symptoms. Uh, it can be pounding heart, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, feelings of choking, chest pain, nausea, dizziness, all of these types of things. When an individual experiences a panic attack, there's this fear uh, because it kind of comes out of the blue this fear that they're gonna die that they're losing control things are you know they're going crazy um, and oftentimes uh, when an individual experiences their first panic attack uh, they may think that they're having a heart attack or something like that is happening to them now panic attacks by themselves are common the majority of the population will have a panic attack at some point in their life. A panic attack alone is not panic disorder. A panic disorder is when the individual has a, a negative response to that panic attack. And they start to fear that another panic attack is going to happen. So with this fear, they start to avoid situations associated with that initial panic attack. They avoid places maybe that are related to where they had a panic attack. They avoid anything also that would key their body up in a way that was similar to the panic attack too. And it's that avoidance that causes the impairment for these individuals. Now the sad thing about this disorder is the avoidance and the fear about having another panic attack for these individuals actually creates more and more panic attacks. So what happens is the individual's body remembers what that first panic attack was like. They remember kind of that experience of uh, chest pain or nausea or shortness of breath or whatever, and they remember uh, what it felt like to be out of control, to feel like they were going to die. And so next time their body starts to have, uh, st their heart starts to beat a little bit faster. Their mind automatically goes, oh no, here's another panic attack. And because they have that worry, here's another panic attack, it spirals and their heart starts beating even faster until eventually the panic attack does happen. And to them, it comes out of the blue. They don't realize that, oh, they were tying it with their heart beating a little bit faster and then it blew out of proportion, but it, it comes out of the blue. Uh, and so they start to have more and more things that they're afraid are gonna lead to more and more panic attacks and more and more fear that things are out of control. These uh, um, panic attacks can lead up to happening very often. I've worked with some clients who uh, are ha having three or four panic attacks in a single day. For other clients, so they still have the disorder, but uh, they may only have a panic attack a week or a little bit uh, less often sometimes even than that. Uh, but there's the fear, the consistent fear that uh, these panic attacks are gonna happen over and over again and really in inopportune times. I worked with a client, uh, a college student once with panic disorder. I've worked with several with panic disorder, but one college student in particular stands out. He was coming home from school and took an airplane flight to get home uh, over the summer break. And unfortunately, uh, while on the airplane, he had his first panic attack. Uh, he, it might have been tied to flying. Uh, he had some fears about flying, but uh, to him, it seemed like it was coming out of the blue. Well, when he got home, he was so worried that he was gonna have another panic attack, so worried that he'd have another one while flying on the airplane to get back to school that he couldn't go back to school. He ended up missing the next semester uh, because he couldn't get on that airplane. 
And by the time he came in to see me, he was having these panic attacks uh, often in his life on a daily basis and avoiding any situation that he thought he might have a panic attack in. So he didn't want to get a job because he would wor was worried that while at work he'd have a panic attack. He didn't want to, there was this girl that he really liked uh, that he had known growing up, wanted to ask her out on a date, but didn't want to, didn't ever ask her out because he was worried he'd have a panic attack on the date. Pretty much by the time I started seeing him, he was only leaving his house to come to the therapy appointments because he was worried he'd have a panic attack uh, in a public place and that would be really embarrassing and he wouldn't be able to get help for it. All right, another one of the anxiety disorders and uh, kind of really ties into that last case that I was just telling you about was agoraphobia. Previously, it was thought that agoraphobia could only occur if an individual also has panic disorder. You couldn't get a diagnosis of agoraphobia without that panic disorder diagnosis first. And that's because individuals with the panic disorder, they typically start to have fewer and fewer places that they're willing to go until eventually they're just staying in their home because they're afraid that they're gonna have a panic attack in public. However, we now recognize that agoraphobia can, uh, can occur on its own outside of panic disorder or can co-occur with other anxiety disorders. But mainly what agoraphobia is, is a fear or anxiety about public places, being out in public. And it's not a fear that you're going to be judged. Uh, you may have some of that, that social anxiety may happen, uh, but really it's just anything for being out in public. So like I mentioned, maybe a fear that you'll have panic attacks out in public. With agoraphobia, the unique part to it is it's not just the fear of those public situations, but the avoiding of those public situations. And so individuals with this disorder oftentimes uh, will start to limit their what where they're willing to go and over time eventually not even want to leave their home. These experiences have to be present for at least six months or more. Uh, and it has to cause that impairment. So I mentioned that that individual with panic attacks, he definitely had agoraphobia as well, only leaving the home to get to his therapy sessions. Another individual that I worked with, uh, she was in her uh, late 60s, uh, had lived her whole life without any type of uh, anxiety disorder. However, one day she was sitting on her porch and she lived in kind of a dangerous neighborhood and there was a drive-by shooting while she was there. And one of the bullets hit her house uh, close to where she was sitting. And that appropriately freaked her out. However, what happened next was uh, she started to believe that nowhere was safe for her and she couldn't leave her home anymore. At first it started to be she couldn't go to the grocery store and then she stopped going to the bank and other places like that. But the more somebody avoids those public situations, the more kind of their, uh, their thoughts are able to take control and say, it's a good thing you avoided it because it was dangerous until eventually she wouldn't leave her home as well. Fortunately, her family members were able to get her and accompany her to the therapy sessions and we were able to effectively treat uh, this disorder for her. Um, but without that prodding from her family members, she would have just lived her life only inside her home. The final anxiety disorder that I want to talk about is generalized anxiety disorder. This disorder is characterized by excessive worrying about everything. Similar to with what we see with depression. Depression is a constant kind of uh, depressed mood, a constant sadness, loss of, of interest in activities, kind of fatigue type thing. Instead, generalized anxiety disorder, instead of the sadness and 
the fatigue, loss of interest. Here, it's a constant worry. Money, uh, relationships, jobs, school, every single thing the individual is worried about. With this disorder, that constant worry has to be present for at least six months, and the individual has to find it difficult to control that worry. Now this disorder, this anxiety disorder, more than any of the others, and because of the constantness of the worry, is often associated with physical problems. And so we see that muscle tension, we see the sleep difficulties, we see the fatigue and tiredness uh, associated with this disorder. These individuals, they're often very productive, very successful in things, uh, but they're the ones who are always kind of on the go, and it always looks like they're worn out uh, because they're just doing so much. And the reason why they're doing so much is they're trying to counter the worry. They're worried, you know, about money. So even though they might have plenty of money for their needs, they're worried always about money, so they're always working to try to make sure they have enough, to try to save more, and try to get more. These are individuals, they might be worried about children, so even though they may be good parents, they're constantly doing everything to kind of uh, protect their children and make sure their children are safe and make sure they know exactly what their children are doing at all times uh, in all situations. All right, so that's generalized anxiety disorder. So those are the main, those are the anxiety disorders uh, uh, that we have. So let's uh, shift gears now and, and go ahead and start thinking about the why of anxiety disorders. Well, with anxiety disorders, there's uh, definitely biological influence thought to play a role. First of all, it's important to recognize that anxiety, uh, our physical response to anxiety, is our fight or flight response. That's the adaptive purpose of anxiety. Our body's actually supposed to do the things that it does when it gets anxious. That's not the problem. Uh, our body's getting anxious and appropriately, it's getting keyed up, ready to either fight the danger or flee from it. As you think about kind of the, the symptoms that maybe you get when you get anxious about things, you can tie it into that fight or flight response. I read an interesting article once. It was talking about all the different ways that the uh, symptoms of anxiety are adaptive or were adaptive uh, when we really needed to fight or flee kind of situations. And this article suggested that in our history, um, uh, well, we would get sweaty. That's a common experience with anxiety, sweating. Uh, and this article suggested that in our history, when we had to flee from predators, a tiger or bear or whatever it might be, uh, we would get sweaty, so we would be more slippery. So if that tiger or bear grabbed hold of us, we could uh, slip away, be sweaty and slip away and run away from that tiger or bear. I thought it was interesting, kind of a humorous look on it. Uh, I think sweatiness is more so to regulate the temperature of our body as our heart starts beating faster and things like that. Uh, but an interesting view. Genetics also plays a role with uh, biological influences on anxiety. It's estimated that uh, uh, about 25% uh, of anxiety is explained by heritability by genetics and uh, that's for any fears at all but perhaps even more strongly uh, well 25% is for clinical fears but perhaps even more strongly uh, if you just look at the association with non-clinical fears being present so perhaps an individual that has panic disorder his or her parents may not have panic disorder but they may ha be anxious people in general. Maybe not at the clinical level, but anxiety is seen there. However, it's still difficult to know, important to remember, it's difficult to know what is actually genes or what is learning. 
obviously anxious parents are going to uh, interact with their children in a way uh, that may lead to anxiety for them. There's a strong behavioral component to the development of anxiety as well. The, uh, this is built on kind of the two-factor behavioral theory for anxiety and built on the conditioning principles from classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And if you're less familiar with classical conditioning and operant conditioning, <coughs> I'd recommend that you click on that link that I have on this slide and check out a video. Uh, that video uh, nicely kind of explains the difference between the two and gives kind of a, a simple explanation for how they tie into anxiety. What we see here is uh, classical conditioning really uh, explains the de initial development of anxiety. An individual has a negative experience and they tie that negative experience to uh, things in the environment, whether it's a specific object or set of objects, they now experience that as negative and their body gets anxious when they're around that new stimuli and that works through classical conditioning principles. And operant conditioning comes into play for maintaining the anxiety. So the individual then, when they face the feared situation and their body starts to get keyed up, they'll do things like escape it or distract themselves from it, or if they can, avoid it. Now, as soon as they do one of those things, their anxiety automatically drops down. They're no longer around the spider or dog or whatever it is that they fear, so they no longer are anxious problem with that though is they the dropping the removal of the anxiety ends up reinforcing that escape avoidance and distraction behavior and the thing gets feared more and more uh, the more an individual does those things it's important to recognize too that with the classical conditioning component uh, it doesn't always have to be a personal uh, experience, personal negative experience with the feared thing, but it can be um, modeled by others. You may see somebody else have a negative experience with that thing, or you may read about how that thing is dangerous, uh, and that can start, uh, give start to the anxiety itself. Since the development of the original behavioral model, people have added a cognitive piece to it. It's not just the uh, reactions to the environment, but it's our interpretation of the environment that also plays a role. And so with this cognitive piece, it starts with a negative event happening, but then there's some type of thought about that negative event. There's an appraisal, a cognition about it. As a result, there's a negative prediction about future events. So the woman that I mentioned who uh, was sitting on her porch and uh, was shot at, the appraisal of that event was, that's dangerous. The negative prediction of future events was, if I'm out on my porch, I might get shot. If I'm out of my home, I might get shot. And so because of that negative prediction of future events, she started to avoid escape or distract. <clears throat> she would avoid going outside of her home. Now, every time she avoids going outside of her home, that relieves her anxiety. She doesn't have to worry. She's safe in her home. But the more she does that, the more she predicts that outside of her home actually is dangerous. And the more she predicts that, the more avoidance she does, and the more uh, relief she gets from the anxiety, but it's this negative kind of spiral where the anxiety actually over time gets worse. So the avoidance and escape sh escaping and distracting is a short-term relief from anxiety, but a long-term uh, kind of cost, a long-term 
perpetuating the anxiety that's experienced. Building on this cognitive behavioral theory, uh, like I mentioned, it's important to recognize what are the thoughts. Just like in depression, there are some common thoughts. In anxiety, there are some common kind of maladaptive thoughts that are seen. First is an overgeneralization. For example, everyone is going to notice that I am nervous. Uh, with that, it's a prediction that overestimates the actual likelihood of an event. So an overgeneralization. The second common type is catastrophizing. Catastrophizing is making a huge thing out of something kind of small. So an example of this, if people notice that I'm nervous, then they will think I'm not competent and I will never make friends, get a job, find a significant other, etc. So blowing up that people are going to notice that I'm flush, that I'm nervous, to I'm never going to have any type of relationships with anybody. And then the final category are maladaptive thoughts. Maladaptive thoughts are true or accurate thoughts, but they don't help the person in any way. They just cause anxiety. So when somebody gets nervous, if they think, my hands are sweating, well, that may be accurate. Maybe their hands are sweating, but that thought doesn't serve any purpose. It doesn't help the individual. A couple other theories associated with the anxiety disorders. There is a psychodynamic theory, um, a psychodynamic view of anxiety. The psychodynamic approach uh, believes that anxiety comes from a conflict of feelings and desires uh, that come up at each stage of development. And sometimes the individual gets stuck on one of those conflicts or one of those stages. And this is early worry. When they have that early worry, then the individual goes and plays it out in different situations throughout his or her life. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a representation of the worry and plays it out in, in different relationships. And so the worry, that stuck conflict, uh, just plays out over and over again in an anxiety provoking way. Finally, there's a humanistic view of anxiety, and it suggests that when individuals have lower levels of self-regard, they have a higher need to look for regard from others, from external sources. They need other people to tell them that they're competent or successful or a worthy person. However, external sources of regard can conflict with each other. Uh, for example, what a, a parental figure says uh, makes you a worthy person might be different from what a peer says makes you a worthy person or what an employer says. Um, and when there's this conflict, the individual develops anxiety, uh, develops a need to try to please all of these external sources. But that's impossible. So the individual is kind of in this constant kind of worry state about uh, pleasing others when there's no real way to please everyone at once. So now that we've covered what anxiety looks like and a few different theories behind anxiety, let's talk about how we treat anxiety disorders. One type of treatment are medications. For anxiety disorders, the medications are typically tranquilizers or benzodiazepines. Examples of this might be Xanax or Valium. Uh, these anxiety medications are fast acting to br bring relief to the anxiety right away. So they, in a way, kind of numb the anxiety. An individual can often take them kind of uh, immediately when they start to experience anxiety or when they uh, believe that an uh, anxiety-provoking situation might happen in the future. It kind of numbs the side effects. However, there are major drawbacks with these medications. First is the sedating side effects. Uh, that numbing has uh, kind of a numbing overall uh, feeling associated with it. Second, they can often uh, become dangerous when they're taken with any other type of depressant, uh, like alcohol, or if they're taken with painkillers or sleeping pills. 
with this too, anxiety medications are uh, easy to become dependent on and very difficult to get off of them uh, when an individual is used to taking them in order to face kind of those anxiety provoking situations. And then last, these anxiety medications really go against the goals of psychotherapy. We'll talk about this more in a couple of slides, but uh, like I mentioned, uh, with the spiral of how anxiety works, uh, the individual often takes steps in their environment, and medication might be one of these, to give a short-term fix to the anxiety. And the anxiety goes away immediately, but whenever you do a short-term fix, it comes at that long-term cost and it keeps the anxiety around uh, for the long run. Also with anxiety, <clears throat> people are often uh, prescribed an antidepressant. <clears throat> These antidepressants are uh, uh, safer than the benzodiazepines or tranquilizers. They're less addictive, uh, harder for people to become dependent on. The drawback of them, though, is they take much longer for relief. So it's not, oh no, I'm going to go do this anxiety-provoking thing, let me take my medication, but somebody has to regularly take the antidepressant in order for it to have an effect. So let's start talking about the psychotherapy approaches now. The first is a behavioral approach. You'll notice in that figure that I have on this slide, the red kind of line is what I was talking about earlier uh, with our often typical approach to anxiety. The anxiety starts to go up, so we avoid escape or distract, and the anxiety immediately drops down. But next time we're in that situation, the anxiety goes up again, and this time it goes up a little quicker and a little higher. We do the avoiding, escaping, or distracting, and it drops down again. And you notice that the same pattern happens over and over until the uh, anxiety just keeps going on up. So for a behavioral approach, we try to get individuals to do the opposite, to instead ride out the anxiety, allow the anxiety to be there. And as they do that over time, they see that, hey, this isn't so bad. Or they see that I can do this. I can conquer the anxiety. And over time, that thing that previously was scary isn't so scary anymore. This is often, this is something that we call exposure treatment. This can be done in a hierarchy where you uh, identify kind of a low anxiety trigger uh, and then you work your way up to harder and harder situations. So for example, that client that uh, had a hard time leaving her house well, we started off just standing by the front door, still inside the house, but standing by the front door, kind of looking out, and then standing in the doorway, and then standing on our porch again, and then going out kind of bigger trips to the grocery store, farther and farther away from our home. Uh, same thing with the client that uh, had a fear of uh, that new job offer that she was given and talking to others. We had her practice. We had her just do practice first, just saying hi to people that she'd pass uh, on the street or in the hallway. Uh, and then we had her uh, engage in a little bit longer conversation. With her, we also did something called imaginal exposures, where we had her imagine uh, leading a meeting, an office meeting, or have her imagine uh, giving critical feedback to an employer under her. There's one other alternative with exposures that I haven't ever actually done with clients, but there's been research uh, conducted on it, and that's something we call flooding. And flooding is, rather than doing it step by step, you just place the person in the most anxiety-provoking situation uh, that you can think of, and they just sit there until they're okay with it. Um, there's some risk to that, some dangerousness. A lot of clients aren't willing to do that type of flooding, but if a client is willing and it's done properly, flooding can actually be very effective for treating anxiety. The second approach for treating anxiety disorders is the cognitive approach. This is often paired with that behavioral approach from the last slide. 
The cognitive approach, step number one, you identify your thoughts. Uh, see what they are. Uh, and these are the statements that you're telling yourself that make you anxious. Step number two, you categorize those thoughts. Are they overgeneralizations, catastrophizing, or maladaptive thoughts? Step number three, you then evaluate them. You take that scientist perspective. What's the evidence for that thought? How do I know that that thought is true? And then, what's the evidence against it? What is there to say that that thought isn't true at all? And trying to look at the real evidence rather than just going with the anxiety feeling. After you look at the real evidence and know the real dangerousness of the situation or lack of dangerousness, then you can generate a new thought. What's the more accurate belief? And over time, by doing this in lots and lots of small situations, you change your core schemas. So the core thoughts that are coming or the ways you view the world and the subsequent automatic thoughts that come to you are completely different, less anxiety provoking. A more recent approach is the acceptance approach. And this is similar to the cognitive and behavioral approaches with some minor changes. This acceptance approach says, the problem with anxiety isn't the anxiety itself, it's our reactions to the anxiety. And so what they say to do is first, build up some space between you and the anxiety. Recognize that anxiety thoughts and feelings are not you, they're just something you're experiencing at the moment. And when you recognize that to and then just allow them to be present, to say, okay, here's anxiety. That's okay for me to experience anxiety. I'm gonna write it out, it's here. So what? Once you accept it, you can then move forward toward your values, uh, even with the anxiety being present. So you're kind of like a bus driver. Anxiety passengers get on board, and whether they're on board or not on board, you're gonna drive your route, and you're not gonna let those passengers tell you which way to go or what to do. And so the acceptance approach kind of gets rid of some of the uh, kind of struggle with anxiety and kind of fighting or challenging the anxiety that you might do with the cognitive approach, but it does still keep the exposures and facing the anxiety. The goal with this is really different though from the behavioral and cognitive approaches. The goal is never to get rid of anxiety uh, with an acceptance approach. Instead, the goal is to live the life you want even if anxiety is present. Finally, real quick, the psychodynamic and humanistic approaches. These are used much less often uh, with treating anxiety disorders, but, um, but they can have a positive effect on them. With the psychodynamic approach, your main goal as a therapist is to help the client gain insight into those conflicts that led to their anxiety to begin with. You do that by having them talk about their past relationships and look for how the conflicts show up in therapy. And once they're able to gain insight, then uh, the thought is that they can act better in ways that don't promote the anxiety. Okay, time for the code word, psychodynamic, and our psychodynamic for the code word for the week five anxiety lecture. And finally, the humanistic approach. With the humanistic approach, you help the client develop a greater sense of positive self-regard and trust in themselves. And as you, and so you as the therapist express your trust in the client 
your trust in their abilities to make good decisions in their life. You also work to express empathy and show them that you believe they are competent and capable, no matter what their behavior is. And you allow the anxiety to be there. And as you do that, then the client learns to see that they don't have to try to please others so much, that they can believe in themselves and focus on living the life that they want to live, not the life that others are telling them they should live, that they can just be themselves. And as they do that, that is thought to open uh, the clients up to allow them to become their best selves.